Secretary of State Antony Blinken makes his first visit to Australia. It's to meet with the other Quad Alliance member nations. He says they share mutual concerns over China's increasing threat. A grassroots movement to quit the Chinese Communist Party comes under assault in New York City. A witness from the scene says she couldn't fall asleep after seeing the attack. How many people died in Wuhan in the last two years? That question remains unanswered. Since the pandemic's epicenter stopped reporting cremation data after the outbreak hit the city, a hotel room gets drenched by a major ceiling leak. Despite rampant reports of building code problems in China, the video sparked discussion online, all because of the guest staying there. And a Christian businessman faces a seven-year jail sentence after his appeal was denied. He was charged with selling uncensored Bibles in his store, versions that didn't get the green light from communist authorities. Welcome to China In Focus, I'm Tiffany Meyer. Before we turn to today's news, we have a short announcement. As you may already know, YouTube has demonetized us for a year. That means our ability to run ads or earn money on YouTube has been taken away. So if you like our coverage and would like to see more, consider donating. Just follow the link in the description box down below. Thank you for your support as we continue to bring you the latest on China. The U.S. is rallying its allies against China's actions in the Indo-Pacific region. On Friday, Secretary of State Antony Blinken met with Quad Alliance countries, Australia, Japan and India. I think we, we share concerns uh, that uh, in recent years China has been acting more repressively at home and more aggressively uh, in the region uh, and, uh, and indeed uh, potentially uh, beyond. But. The Quad is a bloc of Indo-Pacific democracies. Its goal is to counter China's growing regional pressure. At the meeting, the four countries agree to deepen cooperation. That's to ensure the region is free from China's growing military aggression and what's been described as economic coercion. As I said, what brings us together, what uh, unites us is a commitment to defend uh, the, uh, the rules-based system that we have spent a uh, tremendous uh, time and effort building uh, over these many years. A region where sovereign states can, as I said, exercise their own strategic choices, free from coercion. Other topics also top the meeting's agenda, like climate issues, the pandemic, and the crisis between the West and Russia over Ukraine. Beijing was quick to slam the alliance. Friday, China's foreign ministry labeled Blinken's remarks as Cold War thinking. Though Blinken acknowledged China's aggressiveness in the region, he expressed that a confrontation with China is still avoidable. The Quad meeting marks Secretary Blinken's first official trip to Australia. Outside the meeting, he told newspaper The Australian that to his mind, there's little doubt that China's ambition over time is to be the leading military, economic, diplomatic and political power, not just in the region, but in the world. A grassroots movement is under attack in the U.S.'s most populous city. It aims to help people renounce their memberships to the Chinese Communist Party. Here's more. New York City's Flushing community is home to many colorful displays lining the streets. But on Thursday, a man attacked one of them. A pop-up exhibit at an information booth. The booth has been there for over a decade. It's part of a grassroots movement that swept the globe starting 17 years ago. Under it, volunteers around the globe run information booths that help people quit the Chinese Communist Party, or CCP. That includes tourists from mainland China and Chinese people living overseas. The movement has made a splash. Under it, over 390 million Chinese people have renounced their membership with the CCP and its affiliated organizations. Pop-up displays at these booths often showcase photos and information about Beijing's human rights abuses, like the 1989 Tiananmen Square massacre and the decades-long suppression of meditation discipline following Gong. Volunteer booths like these can also be found in Canada, France, Australia, South Korea, and Japan. The smashed booth is located in Flushing, Queens. 
the second largest Chinese community in New York City. A witness at the scene said she couldn't sleep after the incident. I've been volunteering here for 12 years, and it's the first time that I came across something like this. Xu says the man smashed almost everything, from displays to the decorations. A passerby was asking if this man lost his sanity and why he was doing this. Other volunteers say the man in black tried to smash other booths but failed, and that they've reported the case to the New York City Police Department. These volunteer booths in New York have come under similar attacks before. During one of them from 2020, a volunteer suffered light injury. In 2008, some volunteers were physically and verbally attacked. Then New York Chinese Consul General later admitted he encouraged the incident. The volunteers in Flushing say they've already bought a new stand and will continue their grassroots efforts. Two years after the pandemic first broke out, questions surrounding its original epicenter are still unresolved. Exactly how many people died in Wuhan when the CCP virus, which causes COVID-19, first emerged in China? The answer remains a mystery. The city has not disclosed its population data in two years since the original spurge began, meaning no official record of the city's population change is available. Wuhan officials also claim they couldn't disclose data on patients' cremated remains during the pandemic. But since then, they've seemingly revised the city's death toll. It all started when the city's official website halted its regular quarterly report after publishing in the fourth quarter in 2019. The first CCP virus cases reportedly emerged in Wuhan at the end of 2019. That report includes the city's number of cremated remains. But other cities inside the same province, including Wuhan's neighbors, continue releasing quarterly reports regularly. Chinese netizens discovered the problem and reached out to officials for answers. But officials said they couldn't disclose data related to cremated remains. In March 2020, Wuhan authorities announced that more than 2,500 people died because of CCP virus infection. But a month later, they revised that death toll to more than 3,800, a 50 percent rise from the month before. The revision is seen as a response to growing questions from Chinese citizens and other countries about the city's real death toll. That's amid China's history of underreporting its pandemic numbers. As of this January, China's official pandemic death toll is tallied as more than 4,600 nationwide, a figure far lower than nearly any other country. But experts say China's data lacks reliability and coherence and has no research value. A citizen journalist in China is still nowhere to be found after he vanished two years ago. He had been traveling to hospitals in Wuhan back when the pandemic first broke out in the city and shared video of the tragedies happening there. Now authorities refuse to confirm suspicions about his whereabouts. It's been two years since Wuhan's citizen journalist Fang Bin's disappearance. Recently, he's been rumored to be jailed at a local detention center on undisclosed charges, but authorities refuse to confirm that claim. When the CCP virus, which causes COVID-19, first broke out two years ago, Fong went to film inside at least five Wuhan hospitals. In one of them, he discovered large numbers of human remains being moved via funeral house vehicles and confirmed there were more bodies inside. His video quickly sparked interest online, and soon, Fang had local police knocking on his door. But attempts to harass and silence him failed. Fang later started calling for a national campaign to stand against communist tyranny, blaming it for the outbreak. Fang disappeared days later. It's been radio silence for two years, until recently. Someone close to the matter recently got a tip about the case. He shared the details with the Epic Times. Asking to stay anonymous for safety reasons, he confirmed Fang is in custody.
but added authorities had warned aid workers against sending him money or clothing or speaking up on his behalf. The Epic Times reached out to the local prosecutor's office, which refused to provide any information. The newspaper also tried to contact the court and local detention center with no response. A human rights activist gave his take on the case in an interview with NTD. Fang Bing's case tells us the so-called rule of law is a joke. Just because he was concerned about a social public health incident, the authorities arrested and disappeared him for two years, and nobody dares to talk about it. That's a shame. The source says Fang's relatives are also under pressure from authorities and are hesitant to hire a lawyer. On top of his citizen journalism, Fang's wife is a veteran Falun Gong practitioner. The meditation practice has been the target of a brutal Beijing persecution campaign since 1999. She is currently detained over her refusal to renounce her beliefs. A hotel room disaster in Beijing is garnering attention online. A clip posted to social media shows water pouring into the room from the ceiling thanks to a broken water pipe upstairs. Similar incidents have been popping up across China for decades. Spurred by poor construction quality and cutting building code quarters, a new common problem in the country. But this time, the site sparked discussion. That's because it's a scene from the Olympic Village in Beijing. A Finnish skier shared the striking video as her hotel room got drenched. The clip was later taken down and no longer appears on her Twitter and Instagram accounts. U.S. Olympic gold medalist Nathan Chen is facing backlash on Chinese social media, and it may have something to do with his comments about China. The 22-year-old took home gold on Thursday in the men's figure skating event, but his victory didn't sit well with Chinese netizens. On Chinese social media site Weibo, the consensus was that his performance was rather mediocre. Many voiced anger about his win, while some accused him of insulting China. Despite the comments, speculation is rising that the pushback isn't really about Chen's performance. In an interview last week, Chen said he agrees that China's human rights record is abysmal and noted that change at a remarkable scale is needed for improvement inside the country. Some accused him of, quote, insulting China with the comments. Other online criticism stems from Chen's choice of background music. In a 2018 Olympic performance, he used a song from the movie Mao's Last Dancer. The film is set during former Communist Party leader Mao Zedong's Cultural Revolution. It tells the story of a Chinese dancer's escape from Communist China and journey to the U.S. Nathan Chen was born in the U.S. to Chinese immigrant parents. An Olympic skier has something to say about China's draconian internet restrictions. She appeared to defend them in recent comments, suggesting Chinese citizens can simply dodge Beijing's Great Firewall. Gold medalist Eileen Gu was raised in California, but she is representing China at this year's Games. While in Beijing to compete, she was spotted using Instagram. The platform is one of many that's banned in the country. One Instagram user pointed out the issue, asking her, why can you use Instagram and millions of Chinese people from the mainland cannot? The user asked Gu to speak up for Chinese people who don't have internet freedom. But instead, she replied, anyone can download a VPN. It's literally free on the App Store. A VPN is a type of software. It can be used to bypass a country's internet restrictions by hiding a user's IP address. But unlike in the U.S., VPN use in China can prove risky. Many Chinese citizens have been fined or even arrested just for using the software. In an ironic turn, screenshots of Gu's comment later appear to be censored on Chinese social media platform Weibo. Gu has repeatedly dodged questions about whether she renounced her U.S. citizenship to compete for Team China. She says when she's in the U.S., she's American, but when she's in China, she's Chinese. A Chinese businessman's appeal has been denied. That's after he received a seven-year prison sentence. His crime? Selling Christian books. Chen Yu owns the wheat bookstore in China's southern Zhejiang province. He was sentenced in 2020 after being charged with what was labeled an illegal business operation. He was also slapped with an over $30,000 fine for the same reason. 
Chen appealed the decision, but Zhejiang's provincial court upheld the verdict on Thursday. Chen's bookstore was a popular source of books for Christians in China. His shop attracted clients not only from his province, but also from those in north and central China. When he was arrested in 2019, the authorities accused him of having sold over 20,000 Bibles and other Christian books. Over 10,000 more found on the premises were destroyed by local authorities. The Chinese communist regime classified Chen's book selling as anti-China. That's because some of the Christian books he sold were printed in Taiwan and the U.S., meaning those versions weren't scrutinized by Chinese authorities, unlike virtually all other religious books available in the country. As Chen's appeal was denied, he now remains in detention in Zhejiang province. A recent document is laying out rules for education in China. One of them states the Chinese Communist Party should make all important decisions in schools and students should be educated for the party. Beijing's Central Committee released the document late last month. It orders officials to build a principal responsibility system under the leadership of the Chinese Communist Party, or CCP. That directive applies to all student grade levels from primary to high school. The document stresses that the CCP's control should be strengthened, describing that goal as a fundamental need for a smooth-running education system. The document also gives instructions for strengthening the CCP's leadership. It urges all primary and secondary schools in China to have CCP cells on campus, meaning offices directly linked to the Communist Party. It also states teachers should understand that these party cells actually run each school. That means these offices would make all important decisions for their schools, including hiring and leading educators. That's to ensure Communist Party directives are carried out. On top of that, the document also asks CCP cells from each school to report to their superiors and the party periodically and describe in detail what's been done to implement those directives. The breakaway region of Somaliland is siding with freedom. During a trip to Taiwan, its foreign minister stated, we are born free and we will stay free. But Beijing has taken issue with his comments. Here's more. China cannot dictate who Somaliland can have relations with, the foreign minister of the breakaway region said on Friday. Somaliland is a sovereign country again. Issa Kaid was speaking during a trip to Taiwan, which has been condemned by Beijing. China's foreign ministry accused Taiwan of fanning the flames to undermine the independence and unification of other countries by hosting a senior ministerial delegation from Somaliland. We were born free and uh, we will stay free and then we will run our business the way we uh, the way we, we, we want it. China cannot dictate, no other country can dictate who we are going to be. Somaliland broke away from Somalia in 1991, but has not gained widespread international recognition for its independence. Taiwan is claimed by China as its own territory and is likewise diplomatically isolated. The two set up representative offices in each other's capital in 2020, to the anger of Beijing and Mogadishu. Earlier in the trip, Kaid told Taiwan's president Tsai Ing-wen that Somaliland has huge investment potential. Including hydrocarbon deposits, oil and gas, as well as coal, which can be easily explored. On Friday, he said Somaliland was open to doing business with anyone who respected them as a sovereign country. The UK is reportedly attempting to restart trade talks with China. Some lawmakers from the opposition party accused the government of kowtowing to the Chinese communist regime, despite the genocide in Xinjiang and suppression of democracy in Hong Kong. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson wants to restart trade talks with China. The high-level talks have been suspended since 2018. That's according to the political website. The decision risks upsetting members of the Conservative Party. Some of them are already sanctioned by Beijing for calling out human rights abuses. Former Conservative Party leader Ian Duncan Smith urged the British government to think again. 
He told Political he will not let it rest if they start now, amid all the evidence of genocide, brutality, crackdowns on peaceful protesters, and go traipsing along there as though nothing happened. Government officials are reported to be focused on reviving the UK-China Joint Economic and Trade Committee meeting this year. The meeting was held annually until 2018, when relations between Britain and China deteriorated over Hong Kong. Politico also reports that British Financial Minister Rishi Sunak asked Treasury officials to bring back the UK-China economic and financial dialogue. Last held in 2019, Duncan Smith is among the seven UK lawmakers sanctioned by the Chinese regime. Last year, the House of Commons declared that genocide is taking place against Uyghurs and others in China. The motion is not legally bound, but it's a sign of growing discontent among parliament members towards the Chinese Communist Party. Three out of five British schools use surveillance cameras from two Chinese companies, and both of them are linked to Beijing's repression of ethnic minorities in Xinjiang. But a new report reveals it goes even further, with the cameras found in UK police forces, hospitals and public buildings. Here's NTD's Jane Wirral with the details. An investigation reveals more than 60% of UK public bodies operate Chinese Communist Party-linked surveillance cameras. Civil Liberties Group Big Brother Watch analysed data from thousands of Freedom of Information requests. They found that three out of five schools use Hikvision or Dahua equipment. These companies are accused of playing a role in the repression of Uyghurs in Xinjiang, with their cameras having the capability to racially profile individuals walking past them. In addition, 31% of police forces use the technology, as well as more than half of NHS trusts. The Foreign Affairs Committee has recommended that Hikvision and Dahua cameras be banned in the UK, saying in a 2021 report, We recommend that the government prohibits organisations and individuals in the UK from doing business with any companies known to be associated with the Xinjiang atrocities. At the end of last year, a tribunal ruled the Chinese regime guilty of genocide. In response to a question from NTD at the tribunal, Lord Alton spoke of efforts to stop the use of such cameras. I moved an amendment to the Telecommunications Act so that where in another jurisdiction of a Five Eyes country, and I was thinking particularly here of the United States, had banned a company on the grounds of evidence that it had seen of its involvement in the surveillance state in Xinjiang, then we would be required to review their status in the United Kingdom as well. That was not passed, but I still believe it would be the right thing to do. Ministers said that they were with it in spirit, or they should now be with it in practice, and should be reviewing companies like Hikvision. The government hasn't responded in time for deadline. The Big Brother Watch report shows that almost three quarters of UK local authorities use Chinese-made CCTV, but Tower Hamlets Council, where the Chinese embassy plans to relocate, has a different view and says they don't use Chinese CCTV cameras because of the technology's role in suppressing minorities. Jane Worrell, NTD News, London. In the House of Lords, the British Senate, Lord Hunt introduced a revised version of an amendment previously referred to as the Squid Game Amendment in the Parliament. The amendment would make it illegal to travel abroad for organ transplantation unless there is no financial gain involved. Lord Hunt says the aim is to protect UK citizens from complicity in forced organ harvesting. I do feel a sense, shall I say, of sadness at least, that this is the day of the opening of the China Winter Olympics. My Lords, currently, human tissue legislation in this country covers organ transplantation within the UK itself, but it does not cover British citizens travelling abroad for transplants. My Lords, this is a billion pound business in China, using the bodies of executed prisoners, mainly prisoners of conscience. An independent tribunal in the UK concluded that forced organ harvesting has been committed for years throughout China on a significant scale. Prisoners of conscience refers to people who are persecuted for their beliefs. The tribunal found that practitioners of the Falun Gong meditation practice, banned by the Chinese regime, have been one and probably the main source of organ supply in China. The amendment presented by Lord Hunt would prevent UK citizens from receiving a transplant outside of the UK 
without the free, informed and specific consent of the organ donor or their next of kin. And that's all for today's China in Focus. Thanks for watching and see you next time.